Well, welcome to the second video lecture of marketing strategy segmentation in the target market. And we're going to look more in depth, my friends, at this today. We've got buyer's behavior. Okay. So we're going to see how to strategize in marketing broad strokes here and segmentation and, of course, the target market. As you can see the graphic right there, we're really looking for our target customer because the better we know who they are, the better we can serve them with amazing products and services and our own experiences and build our business. The situation analysis, and that was one of your questions, back from the first part of this course in Unit 1, and it's very important in marketing strategy. And so I hope you can take some time, you know, especially if this is going to be your major business. This is the, it's the starting point of a marketing plan. It's the starting point of a business plan. It's basically your research. Again, some people would call it a pest analysis, uh, some, some consulting groups. The situation is just as easy, you know, because we have our, our company and, of course, we have all the forces around us. But this one is the marketing mix, which we have our target consumer and, of course, our product place, price, and promotion people in there, too. And then you've got all those forces around it. So as you ever start with trying to do a little consulting of your own, or, or working on your own business idea, do the situation analysis first, and that gets you moving in right direction. Marketing strategy. Now let's remember, go over what a market is. Again, we've really drilled down on this one. A market is a group of individuals that have the need. Got to have a need for the product or service. Have a willingness, okay? ability and authority to purchase the product. And of course, as we look back on the evolution of our phones, uh, there's still some, I don't know if the Crackberry is still out there, but that was heavily used by business, especially kind of a kind of an older business crowd because they just love the little, the little texting and little typing, really of emails, not, not as much text as emails. Of course, you have your Samsung, your Galaxy, and you have your Jitterbug. I don't know if any of you, I'm sure you do, have uh, older parents or, or, or certainly older grandparents. Do you really want them using the latest iPhone X Pro or the latest uh, Galaxy that Samsung puts out? Uh, it's, it, it's, it's painful sometimes uh, to watch my mother. We've got her the iPhone, I think it's an older one, the iPhone 6. Uh, just to, she can never answer it. She's always complaining, this, this phone just don't work. And she, when she used to have her jitterbug, uh, and my mother was the mayor of Euless for 25 years, uh, during the late, late 80s to throughout the 90s and throughout about 2015, 14 is when she retired. She had her flip phone and she was a demon on it. She could do anything and we upped her, graded her to the uh, iPhone system platform and she just uh, it, it's been pretty pretty bad but you've got different markets different people they're looking for different attributes so consumers all right in the general market but are different we have different wants behaviors resources location in order to find that customer we've got to break it up think of the world of 8 billion people just about you know we can't use that can we for our our business idea Let's let's get it back to Dallas Fort Worth area. Well, there's still and you put in Collin County, we're we're at about 10 million plus in those three counties, and we're pretty close together. Can your business or idea have every single customer? We've got to break it down, break it down, and break it down. So segmentation. We're using lots of different types of demographics. In fact, we get to make up names. We have geographic, all right, where people live. How we say we have how people behave. Of course, a load of demographic, psychographic. There's our name. Uh, again, the personal makeup of each person. So, let's look what Starbucks does. Starbucks is doing some innovative ideas right now going forward. We'll talk about that under branding in our next unit or our next lecture. 
but uh, they've used geographic segmentation for years. And so, again, you can you can look at look at nations, you can look at states, you can look at regions, you can look at neighborhoods, you can look at cities and counties, but neighborhoods inside of different cities. So, what Starbucks one of their models was, we will have a Starbucks uh, drive-through, of course, uh, store that's basically very near uh, neighborhoods that have at least a two hundred and seventy thousand dollar house average value. So that is a market that they said this is this is where we're going to find our target customers, those who really love coffee and who can afford it and who will hit it every day, every other day. And it's where they find that most of their apps, I don't know if you have the Starbucks app, but it's pretty pretty great what they've done. And that's where they found just a one way that they could help segment their market was about two hundred thousand dollars years ago. So now those homes have, have appreciated quite a bit. So somewhere two fifty and up, uh, good place to find a Starbucks. That's how they did some of their geographic segmentation. Now, what about these payday loan stores? I, I hope, my friends, and I do teach a personal finance class. We go in depth in this, but I, I hope you've never had to take a loan out from a payday loan lender. And if you did once, I hope you learned, don't ever do that again because these are rip-off places. They're, they're really predatory. Uh, they do geographic segmentation very well too, and they, they've got it down, you know, they've got down to a science. Uh, they're looking at cities and neighborhoods that may not have all the banking uh, that, that people can go to. And I just did a Google map, you know, pinned a few years ago on uh, Halton Boulevard, 377 Denton Highway, and then Haltom Road. I found 10 payday loan lenders within three miles of each other. Ten. Uh, five were located within four blocks. They believe that they've got a, a population there. We call that the unbanked population. They don't really have financial services, and so they pay dearly to have any checks cashed and any type of loan to float some money through the month. They've got to go through a payday loan lender and they are very predatory tactics. If you just took the loan, the one loan that they did, and if you could pay it back within the two week payday, I think they give you 30 days, your interest is 700% if you annualized it, and that's just not a good deal at all. They're really hard to find in South Lake, and they're hard to find in, in, in near Highland Park. They're there, they're just way outside in different areas of Dallas and, and, and not inside the South Lake Town Square, but in different areas, so, but again, they know their market very well and, and where their market is located. Other things we can use, the demographics. Yeah, again, you like sociology, I think you might like marketing, or if you're going to sociology, you go into demography, and then you can work your way into some very interesting positions. Age, life cycle, gender, income, occupation, uh, education, religion, ethnicity, generations that we just went over earlier. Again, the better we understand our customer, better it is for us. Let's look at a life cycle. Uh, talked about that in our last video. Do we change from, from birth all the way through the life cycle, through adolescence to young adult to middle age to retirement? Yeah, yeah. As we mature uh, in the days gone by, we had a generation, the traditionalists, that tended to really slow down. In fact, unfortunately, some just stopped right after retirement. Uh, I know my father did that and just basically made his, his new home in the uh, den with a big old bark lounger and it was his demise. But we have a baby boom generation that's not doing that at all. They're very, very active. So do they tend to spend less or slow down? Well, there he is, Banana George. That picture was taken when he was 95 years old. Now, I used to water ski quite a bit. So in order to barefoot ski, like he's doing right there, just barefoot doing it, you're, that boat's going 40 to 50 knots an hour. And it's not, it's nautical mile. So it's, it's fast and he's doing it with his teeth. Crazy. Uh, the 60 to 85 year old is a very fast growing market. All right, these are older. These are baby boomers just getting into retirement, certainly in the 70 year old range. And some of the traditionalists that are still very active. Well, they've had access to much better healthcare. Uh, this generation, sorry, you know, for those of us younger, 
they're going to get to retire and they've got some good retirement income and wealth. And so they're very active and not slowing down at all. And their spending is strong. So that age group right there, as you see, that contributes and accounts for 50% of all consumer spending. So if you want to do some numbers, 70-ish percent of our economy is based on consumer spending. Let's say we have a $20 trillion economy. Okay, so start doing 70% of 20 trillion. Okay, that's about $14 uh, trillion dollars right there. And they're responsible for half of that. So that's $7 trillion and we're just rough shotting it of what they have to do. But Anna George, uh, that was taken in the uh, early aughts, mid aughts. He, he lived to about 100 years old. But can you imagine being that old and being that active and being that strong? Uh, I, I don't want to live <laughs> to be 95, but if I live like that, I might, I might have a second opinion. So, 50 is the new 30. 60 is the new 40. People, we're taking very good care of ourselves. That was just a few uh, celebrities that are well into their upper 50s and 60s. And Morgan Fairchild is on your left. She's like 72 there. Uh, it's a huge market, my friends. Anti-aging products. Remember, the f need for ear mortality, the fear of getting old. Uh, baby boomers, and those may be many of your parents for those uh, of us in the class. Uh, they're set to inherit a very large amount of money. Again, as a traditionalist, their parents are, are uh, moving on to the next journey in the universe. Uh, they're getting their money, and they are going to spend it. So if you are interested in that, again, what is your 50-plus strategies? Very good book here called The Longevity Economy by Joseph Coughlin and uh, again, it's, it's just unlocking and understanding this group, especially in the 70-year-old range, because that's where a lot of that income is. And again, they're contributing half of all consumer spending in the economy. So there you are, over $7 trillion right there. Um, most of them say, well, why don't people like us? <laughs> uh, and so get to like them, get to know them, whatever your business ideas are. You know, as we look at markets, we gotta, we gotta, someone has, they gotta have the authority and ability to buy that. So hopefully we can create a product that has a need and a willingness to have it as well. Or service. Again, great time to start a service business because this group does not want to do, they don't want to clean their homes, they don't want to do any yard work, and they don't do any, any repairs, uh, anything on their car, they just want to live life very fast and very full. So if you have a service idea that you could be in business by the end of the week, think about targeting this group. Demographics, yes, gender, okay? Uh, hey, it's a girl's world. Uh, females, fashion, clothing, cosmetics, if that's something you're going to be in that industry, you know, 90% of the purchases overall are coming from female. Art, home decor, furnishings, huge family influencing. Saw that in our last lecture. Uh, through family social media, they really enjoy purchasing gifts for others. And so the decisions in almost all households are going to be run through the female gender, girl power. There's a, some good websites, girl power marketing, uh, $15 trillion influence in the United States. 85% of all consumer purchases are decided through girl power. 61% of tech, that's interesting. 65% of all new car purchases, 91% of all new homes. 60% of personal wealth is control. So 40% uh, of Working women out earn their husbands. Okay, that's very interesting. 91%, I mean, the list goes on and on, and you can do some, some great uh, research here. But it kind of boils down to this 91% of women believe that advertisers do not understand them. You know, they're still kind of dominating towards the male gender in so much advertising, and yet this is where the money is, and this is where the decisions are made. So, in your business ideas, make sure. Uh, you're doing it right. You're doing it right. I had, a, I had a student who had their own business and they were selling some sort of streetwear uh, to uh, guys. And uh, he w was selling, actually it was his girlfriend that was in my class and she was making the business model. 
And I said, well, how, what are your sales? And I said, oh, you know, there's not that good. You know, we, we, we were doing it a month and she showed me some of the designs and they were strictly for men, I guess, kind of street wear, active wear. So you're working out. And I said, well, where's, where's the, uh, the female line? Where, 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 what are you doing for girls? Oh, we don't do that yet. And I go, well, you're not going to be in business very long. Guy might buy a shirt once every two or three months. Uh, your, your, you know, female population may buy two or three shirts a week. So you've got to flip that super fast or get out of the business like immediately because they were really having cash flow problems. Inventory was stacking up all in their apartment and they just wondered why it couldn't work. This is why, my friends. Demographic. Oh, what about us men? All right. Uh, gaming. Well, actually, women out game men. Now, I think we're talking about Candy Crush. Uh, but uh, even some of your hardcore gaming, uh, it's, uh, it's certainly equaled out. It is not as male dominant. Uh, it may be 50-50 split. Trucks, motorcycle, clothes. No. Uh, grooming. Our grooming market is about four to six billion dollars in the United States. So if you're working for a company that's that's focusing on male grooming and uh, possible cosmetics because you know, it's all in that industry, you get a four billion dollar market to look at or you have a trillion dollar market to look at for female uh, segmentation. Yeah, you can see why. Uh, the biggest players are in the female market. It's just it's just a ocean of opportunity. Other demographics and income. Yeah, you know, we always used to say, you know, let's let, let's hit the income, let's hit the high income, and hey, many many do. We're talking about the one percent. I'm looking at it one to five percent that controls about sixty five percent of all the wealth in the United States. So. Yeah, we do have a lot of problems there. And we think of yachts and travel and high-end automobiles. But there's a very small percentage. So uh, there's a working class that, that really needs consumables. And so we look at Dollar Tree, Walmart. Uh, Dollar Tree type of retail has been the fastest growing retail for about the past seven, probably the past ten years. Certainly since the uh, end of the Great Recession that we have from 2008, 2011. And Walmart tried to get into that market. We'll look a little bit more of that in retailing and, and had a hard time doing it. But that, that really, really, really low cost dollar store out, uh, outtake has was, was been huge. Again, 70% of Americans, that's about 200 million people, spend 100% of their income. Uh, the very wealthy barely spend a percentage because they've just got so much wealth. So those of us, again, and if we're working for a living, we're working class, uh, are, are spending tremendous amounts of money. So again, we look at all sorts of consumables and what's the value all right, equation that we are providing for our customers. Psychographic, okay. Uh, that's basically we're using social class, we're using lifestyles, we're using personality. Again, people Try, tend to buy their products that will reflect their personality and their lifestyles like Whole Foods again uh, is organic and I, I, I love organic food I read everything about it certainly there's that genetically modified stuff out there that you know certainly won't won't be your demise but is organic that great over a regular produced item or is it more psychological psychographic again Neiman's why, sh why do I have to be at Neiman's? It's an attitude. It's a personality. I don't know how Neiman's makes it out of this mess. Retailing, which we will look into as a separate lecture, uh, has taken a beating, a literal beating for the past, as we say, five years since 2017 was the, was the terrible bloodletting of retail. And Neiman's has, uh, I believe, filed for bankruptcy. But again, it was a Dallas-based store by Stanley... Marcus, and again, that outfit right there is probably five thousand dollars if it was a if it was a, a dollar. Again, that need for reassurance and worth of, of ego gratification, it just basically says this is who I am, and that's why I purchase it. We can look at behavior. How much is usage? Right. We 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 dive into the market again. Think of the line in geometry. The line in geometry is infinite. The only way we can measure it is to do what? Exactly. You have to make a line segment. That's what we're doing here. We're taking a huge population and we're segmenting, we're making smaller segments and researching those segments to say, hey, who would be my best market? 
So the attitude, how fast is that product being used? You know, how fast will lip gloss go? Will it last a month? Doubtful. Is this going to be an every two week buy? Do we have that repeat business? How, how, how does that affect our sales? All these go into consideration. And of course, we have occasion segmentation. All right. Since this is a fall semester class and in the spring semester, we look at different, different items, but you know, when do you think about purchasing? We are now turned into September, so hopefully fall is close. Look at holiday seasons. Halloween and Christmas, pretty big in the fall, Thanksgiving. How much do you think we spend as Americans on Halloween? We're talking costumes, we're talking decorations, and there's there may be a few gifts, a Halloween gifts there. $8.4 billion for Halloween. Okay. I didn't think it was that much, but that's uh, that's pretty good. So that's mainly just on on decorations and, uh, and, and you know things outside in your yard. What do you think we spend for Christmas on a given year that doesn't have the COVID-19 in it? A trillion dollars. Yeah. That is... 5% of the total U.S. economy is spent just on Christmas. Do you see why Christmas is so important? Certainly in the retail trade, uh, you know, we live just to make it to what's called Black Friday. And that, that day keeps getting moved up so right around Thanksgiving. And again, we call it Black Friday because black means we are, in, we are profitable now. If we're red, that means in accounting terms, you're literally losing money. And so most... Most department type stores like a Dillard's, a Macy's, a traditional retailing has to make it all the way. Once they make it to Black Friday, they're profitable again. And we got to sell like crazy for that next month. We cannot miss Christmas. If it's a bad Christmas, then, then we're done. So interesting. So what do we see early? Uh, I don't know. You know, right now in the early September, if you go to buy some stores, you're, you're seeing the, the you've already seen. It actually starts out in August. Your Halloween decorations up, and now it's not too long. We're probably seeing Christmas decorations just coming out right now. Chris, uh, yeah, for uh, early September, and we got to pump it hard. Got to pump it hard. I think you see why. That's the amount of money that we spend on it. Other behavior. All right, De uh, look at the segmentation that we do. Look at the look at Toyota line. Okay, we have the little Corolla. I think the Tercel still may be out there. I think this is really the Yaris uh, because uh, Toyota took back on Skyon uh, line, which was a Toyota line, and folded it right back into the big product line. All the way to, of course, your Avalon to your beautiful Tundras. Twenty plus vehicles in their product line. That just means. They have a segment, they have a target market. Same person who buys the Corolla is not the same person buying the truck. We have segmented, they're a big enough company where we have, we know exactly, everyone's got a different target market to it. So that's how we're segmenting. Very, very value-based to luxury-based. And of course, we'll look at their top-of-the-line luxury car line as well. So, again, we look at usage. Uh, are we light users? Are we medium? Are we heavy users? Well, we, we, can, we can segment down who's going to eat the most fast food. Well, okay, that's probably, again, 16-year-olds to, uh, to about 27. We know that's a huge market for fast food. Again, uh, the United States, are we users? Well, we're users in the sense that we have 4% of the total population in the world. That's, that's it. 300 and... We'll see what the census says. 330 to 350 million people in an 8 billion world, that's about 4%. Yet we use 80% of all prescription drugs. And you wonder why pharmaceutical companies run the medical industry and why they're so powerful. We pay the most for all those drugs as well. If you could get to Mexico, if you could get to Canada, all of a sudden the the, the drugs that you need so much are... are uh, Almost nothing. My mom's medical expenses each month run over a thousand dollars, and she's only like on five medications or six, and one of them is five hundred dollars for a thirty-day supply. Crazy. Uh, we use fifty percent of all the energy in the world, and yet we're only four percent. So yeah, 
That's why everyone wants to sell to what country? The United States, because we are heavy, heavy, heavy users. Yes or no? Interesting question. Is the customer always right? Now, my father was still alive. He was a product of the Great Depression. Grew up in it. He went, as soon as he turned 18 years old, he went right to World War II. Had no choice in the matter. Fought hard. Came. He was that traditionalist generation. Very conservative is not even a word to describe them. Ultra, ultra conservative. And they had to be. Friends, that was just the life they lived. I mean, they didn't have anything to eat most of the time. Uh, you know, and so, and, and money was beyond tight. So they reused and reused. And they would always say, son, the customer's always right. So what saith thou? Well, my answer is, it depends. Is it your customer? All right. I worked my fair time in retail about five years, and, and I think everybody should have some retailing experience because maybe it would just make us a better person that we wouldn't be so uptight when someone gets it wrong on the other side of the counter or the other, other side of the, uh, the, the web. Okay? We want to look at loyalty. We want to see, who, let, let's just define who our customer is. And for those of you who are in your small business, have a side business, or thinking about going into your own small business, and I think that's fantastic, um, you want to know this soon because sometimes you can chase the wrong customer and, and, and make some really big mistakes because they got to be profitable. So when profitability and loyalty are considered at the same time, it becomes different and very clear that different customers should be treated in different ways. Okay? Strangers, there's barnacles, there's butterflies, there's true friends. The stranger. The stranger are those who barely bring any revenue into the organization you're working for, into your own business, and they're really not loyal. Maybe they come in and they occasionally stop in and, and, and they uh, buy, buy something very small, but otherwise they never use the store. What they're really doing is they're taking up space. And sometimes, for those of us who have been in the retail world, you know, they, they are just complainers and they, you know what, you want to get them in and out. Now, I love Bucky's. I travel to Austin uh, to, to do a state committee once a year. Uh, and at Temple, my gosh, if you've ever driven down I-35 and you see Temple and you see the Bucky's, it is, you got to stop. It is gorgeous. It is huge. There's, uh, I don't know, like a hundred pumps to fill up and gas, which is great. You can get right in. Uh, the, the store is, is ginormous. It's very clean. The bathrooms are amazing. I mean, they are they are so clean. There's someone cleaning them all the time. And again, as you mature a little bit and you're on the road and you're traveling, that's, that's a apparent is, well, how clean is the bathroom? How fast can I get in and out of the store? And it's great. I go there once, twice a year. Uh, I can't say I'm, I'm kind of loyal to it because I love it, but I'm not there. I'm not a good repeat customer. They just need to say, hello, Randy. There, there, there you go. Here's all the stuff you need. Thank you for filling up with gas and, and, and move on. That's just me right there. So a stranger. So you gotta think about who a stranger is, okay, to your business. And then there's a barnacle. Yeah, there's the barnacle right there. Hey, this guy, I can't get him to leave. He, he's very loyal, but he doesn't make a purchase. He may bring in that one cup of coffee, uh, but he uses my Wi-Fi all day long, okay? And then, uh, you know, he, he just, they're kind of taking up space. Now, have we all done that at Starbucks before? I kind of thought it might be interesting for Starbucks to do. I don't think they would ever do it. But if, if you had your own cool coffee shop and you've got this guy in there, say that's me. And I'm just, I'm just hoarding in there. I'm taking up space. And no one, you know, uh, no one wants to sit by me. And so I'm taking up a lot of, a lot of space. Would you put on a little ring or a little ticket on the receipt that you get or text, whatever, that says, here's your code for the Wi-Fi. It's good for two hours. After that, you got to make another purchase. Interesting idea. I don't know. But there's the barnacle. You know, they just kind of, they kind of hover around. They do take up space, but they don't buy a lot. Okay, here's a butterfly. Now, butterflies are not particularly loyal, but they do spend money. Okay, they like a multitude of brands. They kind of float around like a butterfly. They float from place to place to place. 
And so this may be the person, you know what, I think I will buy the iPhone because it's got a better deal right now. And as soon as my contract is up and that one year later, now I'm back to my Samsung Galaxy because they have the best deal. So they're profitable. They're not really loyal, but they do spend money. So we got to understand the butterfly. Who are we looking for? Who is our customer? And again, this is through experience, trial and error, my friends. True friends are the loyalist of loyal customers. They are customers that bring in more than just profitability. They speak. They won't shut up about how much they love that product. And so what are they doing? They're promoting business to others. They do. We have to do this. We have to keep them happy. All right, they are repeats. This is one that says, yes, you are right. If I've messed up, let me make it better for you. Invest in true friends and customer relationship management. This is what we want. And again, I'm sure there's a product out there that you say, I'm a true friend of. Okay. Uh, I, I love it. Hey, I am an Apple fan. I've been an Apple fan since I won't say what decade when they came out. But, uh, you know, they, I thought Apple did a great job in the 80s of actually putting computers in for free basically or giving school districts just a, almost a nominal amount just when computer when computer classes were just coming uh, up in, in curriculum and so they had a, a really went after a younger generation but I'm still very loyal to Apple and other products that I have and I could speak on and mansplain about them until it just makes you sick and we're not going to do that right now how do we how, how do we how do we do it so I've got this graph right here uh, butterflies okay this is this is high profitability right up here okay this is low profitability again how do we treat them uh, we can't treat them all the same if you treat them all the same you're gonna lose business that's just that's just the way it is okay we, we were not mass marketing so here's what we do with butterflies uh, they're good fit they're high profit potential this is a transactional satisfaction they're really not going to be loyal you milk them as long as is possibly active the challenge and again this challenge is experience is to stop investing at the right time knowing that you know what they're no longer interested in whatever I say this is not going to bring them back so there's a butterfly there's a stranger little fit lowest profit potential you got to figure this out as soon as you possibly can. You cannot invest in, in a stranger. You can make a profit on a transaction. Hey, you're here. Great. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay. And again, this is from the Harvard Business Review. So there's short term customers right in. Here's the long term. Here's the barnacle. Okay. There's that barnacle. There's me just hanging out at the coffee shop. And he won't leave. And he's, then he's got his computer and he's got everything spread out. Or, you know, in the business I was in, and I'm going to go over that. I used to be, run a garden center, a lands, landscape managed garden center. And we'd have people that would just love to come in and look at all the beautiful plants. And again, that was perfectly fine because we were four acres in size. But we, you know, we always checked and say, hey, how you doing? But rarely did we invest a lot of time. They're very low profit potential. You know, uh, in this one, again, this is strictly business, my friends. It's nothing personal. You measure the size of their wallet. If it's small, you move on. If it's if it looks like it could be a big, maybe they can be maybe they can be moved into a butterfly. The true friends, great fit with your business. This is your target market. They are the highest profit potential. What do we do? We we always communicate with them consistently. Of course, we don't want to over over communicate, which we see a lot of in the email and text and social media right now, just getting hit every time you open up and be very careful they build loyalty through relationships they bring in so much more than they even spend they bring in so many more customers delight defend retain them at all costs this is the one who's always right these others you have to really understand who we're dealing with because the cust because some of these they're not our customer really don't want them back because they may be causing a lot of problems now, someone said, what about a psychotic customer? <laughs> yeah, you've had those too. That is when you call your manager and say, hey, you need to talk to the manager. I'm going to get paid enough to deal with you. At any rate, there we are. Acquisition. Are customers expensive? Of course they are. Acquiring a new customer can con cost a business up to five times as much as keeping an original one, an existing one. Again, the right customer here. So brick and mortar. Back in the day, you know, when you aggregate all the marketing costs, and marketing becomes a very expensive cost for your business, again, because you're bringing in customers, 
in brick and mortar, it can range, you know, between five dollars for a Walmart, a hundred dollars for a, a small boutique retail business. Internet has been four times as much. It's been a lot better in, in the last five years, but it's been very expensive uh, to get new customers. So. Do I want to spend a hundred dollars? And again, that's all the advertising, the personal sales, the promotion, everything you're doing uh, to get a brand new one. If I have to keep spending money to get a brand new customer because I can't retain any sales, that's a bad business model. So when you look at this, and if you like Shark Tank, if you've ever watched it, you may have seen Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful. One of the questions that he generally asks is, "Hey, what are your what, what's your customer acquisition costs?" And most of the of the most of the time, the, uh, the entrepreneur says, what, "What are you talking about? I, I don't know." He said, "Well, when you know, let us let, let me know because I want to invest in your business. You got to have some idea, and that is your total cost of sales and marketing divided by the number of customers acquired." So. If we look at this one, this is your lead generation cost. This is what it costs. This is the lifetime value of the customer, which is why it's so important. This is a good business model. I'm spending this much. I'm getting this much in return. Sounds good. This is what a bad model looks like. It's costing a lot of money to get a brand new customer, and this is their lifetime acquisition. They're not. I'm not retaining them. And so it's costing me more than I'm getting. So obviously, that is out of business right in there. So it's, again, uh, it's something you need to know, I think, in the business world, especially for those of your own business, to say, hey, how much is it actually costing me in my time, my efforts, and everything I'm doing, and am I retaining them? What is, what, what is the retention rate? It will never be 100% ever, but, you know, again, where is it? Do I have at least half coming back? You know, I can start generating that, uh, a, a, good, a good business model. If, it, if it's way below half it's of what I'm spending, then... And, and way below half of that, that re repeating purchases, you can see the trouble we can get in. A satisfied customer, there it is, six hundred thousand for a Lexus, fourteen thousand for Starbucks, twenty six grand for an iPhone or your Samsung phone. That's just what you're going to repeat over a lifetime. So that's what we need to start looking at customers as, not a one time purchase. What is their lifetime value? The more loyal our customers are, why we have to create it, again, the less time it takes. They, they know exactly what they want, but they're going to bring them in. They're going to be very less price sensitive, too. If someone who's loyal and loves your stuff, you know, the, they, they're there for the service and the experience, and they understand if prices go up. You can actually charge more. And if we can charge more than a competitor can, that is a great business model. If they go bad, again, if it's the right customer that we've had that's gone bad, they will tell people. Okay, that's why that true friend we must delight and defend at all costs. So, we're going to start getting into the target marketing. Now we know why it's so important. All right, uh, people are diverse. Again, the line in geometry is going forever. I have got to segment it, I've got to break it down. So I got to figure out who am I going to serve. So when we look at market segmentation, we want to evaluate the market segments. Okay, the attractiveness. One way to start doing that is look at the size of your market. For instance, the car market in the United States versus the car market in Australia. In a given year, in the Australian car market, there's 400,000 new car registrations per year. Okay, so that's that's new new sales, new and used, you know, purchases. So if you had 10% increase, if you're a car company, you would get about 40,000 more cars. Okay, so is that where we want to go? Let's say, does one of the big three automakers from the United States want to want to go there? Does Ford want to go in there and, and really work harder? Or we look at the United States. The United States car market, 24 million new car registrations per year. So a 1% increase, if I can just get one, I can get 240,000 more cars sold. A half a percent increase can get you 120,000 versus working harder in the Australian to get 10% increases. Again, we're just saying where can I fit in, all right, in my market. Uh, that's one way to do it, the size. 
Again, the attractiveness, the growth of your market segment. <clears throat> we looked at Cadillac for years. Again, there it is. Oh my gosh, that beautiful uh, Seville Cadillac, the big old Fleetwood. It was just, look at that. that. That is beautiful. It's a boat. It is huge. You got this when you were big time in the 70s or 80s. And you said, this is it. This is, I've arrived. Well, that was traditionalist and they were getting smaller by number. Here comes the baby boom. A baby boomer during this time would say, I don't want to buy that car. It's too big. It's too bulky. It reminds me of my grandfather or my grandmother, my grandparents. I don't want that. And so Cadillac looked and said, Our, well, we have to change. We have to change everything to go for a younger car market and a younger buyer. And so you, because the ones that we're doing are just not going to sustain our company in the long term. You know, maybe Sears should have done the same thing. <clears throat> Kodak as well. So you can see the evolution here of what we've come into. Again, is there enough growth? Is there enough people in this market to make it attractive for long-term success, depending on the size of my organization? How's the competition? That's another way to look at that market. You know, if I was trying to do a new cell phone and uh, I just got this great idea, What's, what's, what's the success rate of me putting in a brand new cell phone? Uh, no way. Not with the competition. Back in the day, there was a uh, company called Food Line. I still think they're in North Carolina. And that's where they're based from. Grocery store. Now, the DFW grocery store market is ultra competitive. I mean, it is fiercely competitive. Kroger, Albertsons, Tom Thumb ruled the day when Food Lion tried to come in. And this was before Walmart even started offering groceries at their uh, stores. They didn't have the neighborhood Walmart. And so Food Lion comes in thinking they can run the table on us. We do things better. We, uh, we're smaller, but they're still pretty good size. We, we buy in different bulks. And they were actually telling how, the, how great they were in all the commercials. The day, I think, 25 Food Lions opened up in DFW area. Maybe more than that, but let's just say 25. Uh, all the big three, Kroger, Albertsons, Tom Thumb, and anyone else, was triple couponing to a dollar. So what that means, if you had a 30 cent coupon, we tripled it three times. As long as it did not exceed a dollar, you use it. So it's 90 cents coupon now. That, that's, that's what that coupon's worth. These three basically drove Food Lion to their knees, and they drove them out of business within five years. Actually, I don't think they made it two or three years. So because it was just so fair what's the competition going to do is it a big enough is there is it a big enough piece of the pie here where i need i can get mine now you look at natural grocers they've come in pretty strong are they competing head to head with a kroger a natural grocer is all organic and they're small and they have a lot of different supplements and different health uh health products and food and but they're but again it's a very small footprint and it's really not toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Kroger. So Kroger said, well, well, what can I do to, I really don't compete that well against you. So we'll let you slide. You know, again, they have positioned themselves with a niche that is for a very, very, very uh, targeted market of health conscience person. So again, how competitive, what's the brand loyalty? Can I get someone to switch to mine? And how will the competition react? Now, Let's say we have to we have to say that the suit is my product, is it suitable to my market objectives, my resources, my capabilities. So Walmart. Walmart now selling Armani suits and Jimmy Choo shoes. Okay. That Jimmy Choo shoe right there would be seen at Neiman's, would be seen in Beverly Hills, New York, London, Paris. It's probably a three thousand dollars pair of, of, of shoes there. Walmart's going to sell it. Now they've got the distribution to do it, right? They're huge. Biggest company in the world. Biggest retailer in the world. So they're saying we've got this in our stores. Instead of $3,000, we have got it down to $1,399. $1,399. And the Armani suit, that's $3,000 suit right there. You could get one at Nordstrom's, possibly. Uh, but you really need to go to the Armani store in Beverly Hills and Dallas. I mean, it's very, you know, again, when you're, you're buying these products, you're buying the entire experience. But Walmart's got it for about $1,200. Is that a good idea? Probably not. 
We also have to think of the brand in here. Does it make sense? Does it make sense for Walmart? So if you're going to want to buy a pair of our uh, Jimmy Choo shoes or an Armani suit, you're, you're going to buy that experience. You're really not interested in buying an Armani suit, which is located, their display is located next to the garden center. It just doesn't, it's very confusing. And yeah, a few people would probably try to get a, get this, get a low price. We understand that on, on, on the things. But for long-term success, what did we just do to the brand of Jimmy Choo or Armani? We just blew it up, didn't we? All of a sudden, you're buying one and you're hearing, what, well, hey, Walmart's now carrying that. Walmart wouldn't like it either because even the typical Walmart shoppers, why am I paying $13.99 for a pair of Jimmy? I don't even know what this is. Uh, I'm, I'm not here to buy that. So it's got to be suitable, you know, the distribution, everything to get to our market. You know, it's, it's, we got to have the capabilities and the resources as well. Works in the opposite direction too. I once had a young uh, couple that was doing a little bit of business consulting with, and they, he was excellent. He was excellent in cabinetry and cabinet making, and they wanted to get into South Lake Market. I said, okay, well, there's a difference between going to, you know, uh, HEB, Arlington, some of Fort Worth, going into to a very high, high brow market. W what services are you offering? Well, we can go in there and we can do all their cabinets. I go, great. Do you do countertops? Oh, no, no, no. They would have to call somebody to do the countertops. Okay, do you do the plumbing? Because, you know, if you're going to put in, you got to do the plumbing and the electric work. No, we would have to ask them to do that. I go, well, they're not going to buy that. You know, somebody in, in those areas, they want a turnkey operation, want a full remodel. I call one person, that would be you, and everything else is done. Now, you may need to have some contractors that can do all that, but it's got to be done very professionally. The the trucks you go into and some of these in Highland Park, the, 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 you know, they've got to be brand new. It's got to have that look to it. It's got to have the resources and capabilities to reach the market you're going after. Strategies in target marketing, we have the mass marketing which is undifferentiated. We have different, we have segments that we go after. We have the concentrated and we have the micro individual level. Let's look at that. All right. Again, all of these that we are on our target market, we've got to be able to offer the superior value. The image has to match the location to serve, how they're going to find the product, get the product, possess the product. Do we have all those resources? So, we look at the undifferentiated approach. All right, many people call that Walmart. Well, Walmart just sells to everybody. There's so a lot of people who go into Walmart, but do you think they know who their customer is? Or Target? Target. Here they are. According to data, Walmart shopper is this. She's a 55-year-old female with an annual household income of $53,125. Once all the big stuffs, you know, the, the rent, the house payment, the car, electricity, the utilities, Walmart can count on 40%. They own 40% of her money uh, of, con of consumption. That's the minimum. Now, Target, all right, a little different. According to their data, uh, their average shopper is 45-year-old female with a household income of 65000 So about a about a fifteen, about a twelve thousand dollars spread there. A little bit younger, about ten years in you, so more millennial driven. And as you look at the stores, when Sam Walton did Walmart, he said, "Man, if you, if it's in the back, if it's in inventory, I cannot sell it. I want it on the floor." So he really raised the shopping aisles and uh, that you can buy to to high levels, and because it does psychologically says, look at all this product. I'm going to save some money. I got to get value here. And you and I know that Walmart does not always have the small, the, the, does not always have the lowest price on, on every item. You can even find some small businesses to get you a better deal. But the perception is all this product, I'm going to save money. It's very, very interesting. Target, as we look at on this side, everything is at eye level. We're selling fashion here. We're selling value here. So you can see, is it, is it, is it hitting the core customer that they believe is theirs? Well, obviously, the, the truth is yes, because the, both companies are very, very successful. Differentiated, so is basically like a Procter & Gamble. If you ever work for Procter & Gamble in life, that's great. They are our biggest consumer company that we have in the United States, located, I believe, still in Cincinnati, Ohio. But they have 300 brands. 
So they have different, like every, every brand in here has its own mix, its, its own segmentation, all right? So uh, that's what we can use. They're just big enough to have that. Those are going to buy, again, Clarial versus Aussie, two different segments right in there. So every product brand, their lines right there, are, have been segmented to reach a variety of customers. The concentrate is what most businesses use is the one target strategy. And that is like Whole Foods. Okay, we're, we know that we're not going after that same Walmart shopper. Okay, not, at least not the core. We, they're going to be affluent, gonna be very health conscious. They want organic choices. They want vegan choices. We want non-genetically modified organisms. We want fair trade. We want an experience as we go through the shopping. So, one of the projects in this course will be in the third unit. We're actually going to construct a marketing plan. And I've got the case for you. So again, we've got to figure out what strategy we're going to use. And I'm pretty sure and it's going to have to be, like, let's just put it this way, it better be a one target market. Now again, it can be primary and secondary targets, but we're going after one specific area. So target marketing, why is it so important? If I had a food truck, all right. Yeah, I still have my target market right in here. It's the concentrated, the single segment. We have that one target with a primary and secondary target. So one, one market we're looking at, and inside there we can look at primary and secondary. What's your most small businesses if we're going to survive? So if we did create a food truck, I'd say, well, shoot, man. Uh, let's just go Dallas-Fort Worth. Arlington, I got five million right in there. Everybody is my customer, potential customer. Now, don't 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 think of it that way. I am going to really figure out who my customer is. So, as we look at it graphically, we've got the total population, we've got a potential market, an available market, a qualified available, a target, and a penetrated market. So, the potential is you know these are the people who may have an interest in acquiring your product or service. The available market is we, you know, again, we're drilling down or we're getting closer to our target. These people who, who may have the money, yeah, they're, they, they have a possible interest and they may have the money. Okay, now we're qualifying them. These are the people who legally are permitted to buy the product. These are decision makers. So we're getting much closer to what we want. They have interest, they have the money, and they can decide. The target market. Of the qualified available market, this is the segment that I have, deserted, I have decided to serve. And what's better than the target is the penetrated market, which means these are actual customers that are buying your product or service for the organization you work for, for the business that you own. So I'm going to kind of get a little more granular here. And we're going to look at Northeast Tarrant County. Now, this was an industry I was in for a while. Uh, in the mid to late 1990s, Northeast Tarrant County was really starting to blow up. It was just people were moving in from different areas. Dallas and Fort Worth becoming the hot spot to live. Great economy. In this time, there's about 100,000 homeowners in Northeast, not all of Tarrant County. This is just the small cities. Fort Worth is not included in here. So you got Hershey, Lewis, Bedford, Grapevine, Keller, South Lake. That's really what the heart of Northeast is. Yes, there's Altum City. Uh, and there's Watauga, but uh, we're really looking at this area north of 121 and following up, or North River Freeway following up to 121. So, is everyone our customer? Well, I did some research. I was getting my MBA at this time and I was researching this segment because I worked in it. And I said, you know what? Things are changing very, very fast. All of a sudden, we have a lot more competition coming in. We need to hone in on our market. Who is our target market? So it came up with some other consultants. We came up with four unique customer segments. And here they are. And, they, and, and they're the same today. Every, every number you see in here is just needs to double because right now there's 200,000 homes in those areas I was talking about. So everything is doubled. There's a dabbler for those of us in the, who, who love to garden. Um, the dabbler is this. They're 50% of all homeowner gardeners. Okay, They spend up to $200 a year, primarily in the spring only. Now, if I were to calculate their worth, in the 90s, they were worth $10 million. So today, they're worth $20 million. 
because there's 100,000 of them. Then there were 50,000. There's an impulse buy. This is a certain person who kind of spring is here. They're driving their car. They see the garden center or they see flowers. They say, oh, man, you know what? I got to do something for that. So it's just a quick purchase. If I were to rank them in loyalty, I'd say they're a stranger. Uh, if I rank them in adoption status, I would, I would rank them as a laggard. They're interesting. They do buy. It's a lot of money, $10 million, but it's a quick hit. If it's a bad spring, when I say a bad spring, if it's a wet, cold, rainy spring, the dabbler never comes out. They never show their head. They, they just they say, ah, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to wait on that. I put the flowers in the ground. I didn't water them. They die. Huh, I tried. I'll get it better next year. So there's the dabbler. Here's a decorator. Decorators at homeowner is 27%. They'll spend $400 a year on landscape materials for their yard. Not, this is not include mowing costs. This is just what they actually go out to a garden center and purchase. So there's 27,000 of those. Again, everything is doubled in today's terms. So they're $10.8 million. Today, they're $22 million. They really like a nice yard. They say, ah, oh, that, that looks good. I wish I could do that. I just lack the information, the knowledge, the patience to do it. So they're kind of the barnacle butterfly. They can be across here. Sometimes they would just love to walk in the garden center because they loved it so much and then they, but they just didn't know how to do it at home. Okay. Uh, they're kind of that mainstream adopter, but they will spend $400 and they may spread this out throughout the year. I mean, the dabbler was just going to buy it in the spring, the decorator, they'll go spring and pot and, and at least through the summer, they'll, they'll, they'll buy some color change outs. So that's interesting. There's your amount of money right there. Then you have a cultivator. Cultivator, this is someone who really is into gardening. They're really into their home and the outside appearance of it. It's a smaller number. We're getting smaller. It's 20% of the gardeners, but they'll spend $800 throughout the year. So they'll go to the Callaways. They'll go to, uh, again, any garden center out there. That's $16 million worth of sale. A smaller number, but bigger buyers. They're into gardening. They like it. They're becoming a friend to you if you own a garden center. And uh, they, they're an early adopter. They're the early mainstream. Like they see something, hey, that's a new plant. That's a new look. Let's get this yard looking great. And then we have what is called their nirvana. The nirvana of garden customers. They're called master gardeners. They actually may have a master gardening certificate that you can get from uh, the Botanic Garden Center uh, in Texas A&M Agricultural Research. 3%, very small, only 3% fall into this, but they will spend two grand a year. They're buying $500 spring, 500 summer, 500 fall, 500 winter, somewhere in that area. And so it's $6 million of sales just right there. But more than that, these customers are the innovators. Okay, They'll buy it first, they early adopt, they are the influencers. Remember, generally speaking, always, your influencers are the smallest amount of people, but they influence the greatest amount of, uh, of others. So they have a tremendous change and influence over the cultivator and, de and decorator. These are the people that can bring that decorator up into uh, uh, an, uh, to the cultivator. They'll bring this person to here and possibly bring them to their level. They are true friends. They are the innovators. They desire a garden experience. So, my friends, you've just been given a garden center from your great, great uncle. And what do you do now? Just again, every number is doubled right now. In the 1990s, coming in, all of a sudden Walmart said, you know what? We want everyone, Home Depot, Lowe's, we want everyone shopping here all day long. Why? I don't want them going to a garden center. I can do that. They're, we're big and bad. So these three really came in with, uh, with vigor and a purpose and abandon, we would say, to really crush the independent garden center out. Uh, because again, they, they have great power in the distribution channel. They can tell the suppliers, you're gonna, we're going to give you $20 million worth of sales from your end and you're going to do everything else for us. You're going to stock us. You're, you're going to keep us clean. You're going to take any return. So they had tremendous power and we get first in line to get the best plant materials and garden materials and, and landscape materials. So in our little area, there was 43 million up for grabs. Today, there's basically 90 million up for grabs and you've got a lot of strong competition. So those four segments, 
Who do you want? Who are you going to build your business around? Well, here's my advice to you. Our primary targets were the master and cultivators. All right, those were our two primary targets right there. They will grow the business and purchase you around. That was a little pun right there. They're going to grow the business. I, mean, I thought you'd like that. Secondary target. Now, we didn't, we didn't disband on the decorators or dabblers. We identified them and knew they were some type of a customer to us. They could be good customers and possibly move them to a cultivator. I mean, the decorator was, was the wild card because we could move them up possibly with the right master gardeners, get them in, in contact and, and, and figuring out ways to do that. The dabbler was important only in the spring because we knew that's when they were going to buy. They were going to buy those quick purchases. They were going to come in and throw down $200, and you had to have it, you know, quick, quick in and out because that represented just a, a good chunk of money. But you didn't want to spend a tremendous amount of time with them. So now that we identified our target markets, again, the biggest right in here, and these were important. This was important, but in a different way, okay? Could we just say, all right, game over. We've done it. We've <laughs> we figured out who our customers are going to be, our primary and secondary. Let's go. Uh, let's just go sleep a little bit, and let's just go out fishing. We're all good. Well, now, now you gotta you gotta back all that up. So, what we had to do to get the first two, of course, that's what we were going after. We had designed the gardens and around the needs of our target market. So we had to make it look like this. It couldn't just have plants on the side of the road. Again, we were located at the intersection of Glade Road and 121. That was the intersection of going right into Colleyville, Colleyville, and then you could get right into South Lake. It's just blowing up in this decade, in the late part of the decade. So we had specimen plant selections. We had to have an inventory of basics, but we had to have specimens that you just could not find anywhere else. You had to come to us. We had design services. Okay, that was part of my job. I, I uh, was a master gardener, uh, and I also was a landscape designer. So I designed gardens, I uh, designed uh, projects. We installed them, okay, because we knew Home Depot couldn't do that, and Lowe's couldn't do that. Finally, after 40 years in business, Callaway's is what they've done, is this they've finally contracted with some landscape professionals that they can install your yard for you. Uh, put, you know, basically install your plants, but nothing like we did. We did a full-blown, I mean, I'm talking a full-blown architectural design and, and installation, and, and we had to market it right. We worked on it. It was a beautiful thing to come see that the garden center has been, was bought, it's where the super target is now. Uh, my boss, I was a minority owner, and uh, my boss basically uh, was able to sell out very well, and uh, we, we, we did well. But here's, here's, here's what happened when we figured out who our target markets were, and we generated everything from the marketing, the advertising, all of it to them, and to the look. Our sales went one year from $470,000. To two million within within a little under two year time frame. During the same time frame, seventy percent of independent garden centers closed. They basically couldn't make a living anymore. They they had the land; they were able to sell their land out, but they were gone because they didn't see what Depot, Home Depot, Walmart, Lowe's was doing to this industry. The, what the mass merchandisers were. All I am saying here is when you, f it, this stuff works, when you find out who your customer is, who your targets are, and you generate everything around them, good things happen. Yeah, there was some good fortune. We had really good weather. Uh, we were in a good spot, but you, you know what? Uh, is there such thing as luck or do you have to create your own luck? I think there's a lot being said that, you know, you do have to create your own luck. You have to be ready when the opportunity meets, all right? When preparation meets opportunity. That's, that's a definition of luck. So it does work, my friends. It does work. In the end, it's about positioning and marketing. And that is, remember what it means in your mind when you think of a product. What's coming to your mind? Has anyone ever been fishing before? Maybe you went fishing as a kid and you went to a camp. And maybe you had the Zebco. For those of us who are a little bit more... Mature, we remember fishing at uh, Camp Carter in Fort Worth, maybe with the old Zebco 202. These were just old, cheap reels that you would cast out. They may have, you know, cast about five feet. 
and your little worm bait flew off the hook another 20 feet and you know it was just a little bit of fun they're cheap now zepco is huge they are a huge corporation so you never thought of it as really great equipment as much as very functional equipment it was your first fishing rod now zepco wants to get into the professional sport fishing and tournament fishing market so what they can do is you know engineer a reel like that in the in the three to five hundred dollar range beautiful engineering good looking reel and they put zebco on it how would that work you may for those of us who knew what zebco was said wait a second wait a second that's zebco why yeah it looks nice but my brain is confused i'm thinking this type of zebco not this so when Zebco entered into the professional sport fishing market, knowing that it's a, it's a very strong market, they built this reel. And they built some amazing products and rods that again, in anywhere from 100 to to $1,000, so 100 bucks to 1,000. They put the word, you can't see it right there, quantum on it. Now, now how does that sound? Quantum, wow, that's big, it's like quantum physics. I mean, this is huge. And they own it. So basically they spun they basically created a new organization, a new company within Zebco. And by the way, Zebco never wants you to know that they own Quantum because they don't want you to, to think, you know, to get confused. They're positioning it as a very, very high performance, high priced piece of equipment. When Lexus came out in the early 90s, when Infinity came out, when Acura came out, you had three car companies trying to compete with BMW. Volvo and Mercedes. So, who owns Lexus? What's their parent company? Correct, it is Toyota. Toyota never wanted you to know that. It's certainly, at least in the 1990s, when this car came out, they could have put it in the umbrella, okay, in the family of, of Toyotas. Now, the highest Toyota at the time, I think, was called the Cressida in the very early 90s. It was the Camry, but the Camry was very small. The Corolla was very small. They were, they were value driven. You can get a good car at a very low price and drive it forever. How would Lex? How would the LS four sixty fit in there? We had to have a new brand. Infinity, owned by Nissan. Acura, owned by Honda. Again, they wanted a luxury brand competing against the German and European cars, and so we created a whole new entity same engineer you know the, some of the same employees designing and, and creating the car so it would position in your brain differently there's my old pickup i used to drive i wish i had it today it wasn't nissan in the day it was datsun if anyone can remember all right now datsun basically changed the name back to nissan which is the parent company in japan and we have the nissan line uh Datsun, they're going to resurrect it. They've been resurrecting it, all right? They want to bring back the line, and it was the cool stuff that they had out in those 1980s. How could they reposition that car brand after 30 years off the market? Where would it go? Well, here it is. It's the Datsun Go and the Datsun Go Plus. So they reposition the brand, and it's you will not find it in the American car market. This is in the Asian car market, specifically India. All right, they've done a little, again, they've got the young Z, millennials and Z generation in India, basically we're calling them the risers. They are those who are ahead of the curve. You know, they, they may have never owned a car before. And so this is an entry level car to get into that market. So they're very sophisticated. This is the research. They're, they're mobile, they're social. Uh, they want a brand of their own. So that is, what Nissan repositioned the Datsun. And here's what it looks like. Not a bad looking little car right there. It's $6,400. It's an inline three, which means it has three cylinders to it. It's a five speed manual transmission. If you've ever driven a manual before, uh, it's work. Uh, 68 horsepower engine. Okay, that's a little more than a riding lawnmower. All right, not bad though. 32 miles per gallon, 35. Sideway, 0 to 60, 
you know, it, you bake an egg, fry an egg, and you can make it in 15 seconds. Top sp speed is 94 miles an hour. Not that it ever go that fast. You must be dropping it off a mountain. Uh, and again, it's a front drive. This is the problem that Dotson had. They got their market. They figured out who it is. Young, sophisticated, educated. Uh, hey, you know, those in India, if you can get into college, it's so competitive. They may have a master's in computer science, so they're, they're extraordinarily high-tech. Fashion, image, and Dotson couldn't figure out, it's been out a couple of years now, why this thing couldn't sell. Now, just look at the pictures. That screaming sophistication. There's no radio in it. There's just a little thing for your phone. That's you don't know they, they they don't want a radio. Um, nothing LCD. It's it, the old plastic knobs that will break if you hit it too hard or you twist it too hard. There's the old emergency brake. There's your standard right there. Um, the sales have been stagnant, stagnant. Now another car company also went for the same market, Renault, and they called it the Quid. And they based it after a SUV model. And that, that, that looks pretty cool. I mean, let's see what, what we've got. $5,000. That's all it cost. You wouldn't, I, I'd, I'd take a $5,000 brand new car if I just had a, it's like a, you know, a, better than a Segway. Yeah. Uh, better than a, a, a little moped. And so going to work and back, going to the store, that looks pretty cool. They really understood who their customer was. They went to the same market that the Datsun went. Again, you're not going to see this thing on the stage. You'll see it in India. You'll see it in parts of South Asia, Southeast Asia and, and, and China. 25 orders when it first came out. Oh, they had an app you could order it on, by the way. On their app, from the phone, there was 25,000 pre-orders. Interesting. Now, that's the interior. All LCD. Uh, yes, yeah, still a standard. But doesn't it, it, that looks pretty cool. For some reason, their sales have been very, very well. How do you reposition? Dotson, oof, didn't get it. This company is getting it. It's all about the mind, my friends, where the company, the product lives. We can use maps uh, on positioning. We do this in research. Just what do you think? What is on, on luxury SUVs, again, what do you think is high price? What's more luxury? What's more performance based? Where do you sit? It kind of gives you an idea of where you are versus your competition. So we have Land Rover and the Land Cruiser neck and neck right here. We have full luxury SUV and expensive um, big, and the big Lexus. And then we have the uh, Cadillac Infinity and the Lincoln kind of tied up right in here. So again, this just what this does, it just says, okay, here I am. Here's my competition. Customers can identify much better with me. A little bit harder time identifying with that, possibly. As you choose a positioning strategy, again, in the marketing plan that we're going to look at in the, in the unit three, just anything, my friends, in your own business. What makes you different? What's your competitive advantage? That's how we are selecting our positioning strategy, and the right and the right competitive advantage. If you don't have a comp uh, if you don't have a competitive advantage, don't compete. That's old Jack Welch. And my advice is, you better get one. And if you can't get one, then it's going to be very difficult for you to compete. The values of propositioning of your positioning. Again, we have more for more. And with the value proposition, we're going to give you more for more money. Okay? The product comes out. We may go more for the same. All right? We go, may go more for less. That's interesting. I'm giving you more attributes in the product, and I'm charging less for it. So these are very, these work in the marketplace. I may give you the same for less. Okay, I'm not doing anything, but I'm just lowering my prices. And of course, this is the dollar store mentality in the Walmart, but much more dollar store. It's less for very less. You really, you know, it's difficult to have the same benefits and charge more prices, and charge a higher price. Okay, um, Apple kind of rolls right in here. It's an expensive product. Every, they rarely discount the product, but every year what happens, a new laptop comes out or every other year, uh, their new phone comes out. You have more benefits to it and they're keeping the price somewhere around the same. 
Now, I asked a student one time, he came up pretty quickly, where do you get less at your benefits and more? Which means we're just raising the prices. And he came out pretty quickly and said, yeah, my apartment for rent. <laughs> they go up every year tremendously and there's nothing new that I get. So there are some interesting areas, areas that, can, <laughs> that can do that. But these are what we would call the winning value propositions uh, in the positioning mold. I'm, I'm, giving you, uh, I'm giving you more benefits, but I'm charging you less. We're just giving you more for more. We, we've got something that's so incredible that you're going to want to buy that. Again, there we are. I've got that more for more. And you should have this PowerPoint available to you. More for the same, the same for less. More for less. Yes, you can do that. That's difficult. That's, that's like short-term sales promotions. I'm giving you a lot more for less uh, unless you are a dollar store type of business that can, that can basically compete at that level because your margins and your business model, I mean, you're, everything is low cost. You're not paying your employees very much. You, and you're not uh, in the, probably the nicest locations. I mean, you're, getting, you're really driving that price down. More for more? Core? Water? All right. $5 a bottle? It does taste good, though. Developing your positioning statement. This will summarize the brand, the format. Again, who is it to? What's our brand? What are, why are we different? So, when developing a positioning statement, and I developed one for Glade Road Garden Center, we want to make your yard an extension of your home. We offer landscape design, installation maintenance, specimen plant selections with native varieties, organic solutions for your lawn and plant needs. We also have classes and workshops on a variety of gardening topics. The positioning statement helped drive the marketing plan. So that was the image that we wanted to create in the minds of our target market. And of course, as we communicate the position, which is the part of promotion, just a little inference here, we never want to confuse our customer. So we had to up our game. Your business needs to up its game, whatever the chosen positioning strategy is. I want to make sure that it's obtained through consistent performance and communication. And that's called integrated marketing communications, which we'll talk about more in the promotional element. But just you want to have that look for all your business, uh, on the marketing you do, on the advertising you do, on, on your social media, website, everything. Want that consistency. Friends, I hope, again, we're taking really broad strokes here on a very large subject of marketing, but I, I think hopefully we have a better understanding of the steps as we design a customer-driven marketing strategy, how to segment the market, how to break something down, and find your target market, and then create the positioning that you want. Next video, we'll look at brands and products and services. Let's make it a great day.